I'm Sue Stokes. I am a professor in the political science department here at the U of C. And I'm also the faculty director at the Chicago Center on Democracy. Um, if you haven't heard about us, that's probably because we're really brand new. We're about six months old. Um, and we are an academic center that seeks through our research and other um, events and community activities and teaching to uh, promote understandings of how democracy works and how it can come under threat. Um, so let me introduce Steve, um, Professor Levitsky from Harvard University. Um, he is a professor of government and he's the co-author, as you probably all know, along with his colleague Daniel Ziblatt, of an amazing book that came out last year called How, How Democracies Die. This is a really unusual book by two academics which simultaneously pulls on their, um, their expertise in comparative politics and in political history, um, but also to, to pose and, and suggest some answers to key questions facing the United States and other countries today, um, while at the same time writing in a way that is um, accessible and engaging for broader audiences of the public and policymakers and, and, uh, and, and many more. Um, it's been translated into 15 um, languages, which is um, really a remarkable achievement and exciting to see that, that, that the word is getting out um, all, all over the world, not just here in the United States. Um, it uh, very eloquently draws on US history and histories of several other countries to demonstrate how democracies decline focusing heavily on the role of unwritten norms um, in and how they're violated and the, the, uh, the phenomenon of the violation of informal and formal norms in the erosion of democracy. Um, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to start by asking Steve some questions and, um, and kind of in sort of interview style, we'll have a little conversation. And then we're going to open up to, to the audience. Um, so join me, please, in welcoming Steve Levitsky. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about democratic breakdowns. Um, I know you are not sure in your own mind whether we are seeing a kind of wide surge of erosion of democracy. And you've written in earlier academic work about the, the construct of sort of hybrid regimes, regimes that are neither sort of fully democratic nor fully aut aut autocratic. Um, talk to us about the phenomenon of um, possible erosion of democracy, not by military coup, not by kind of dramatic breakdown, but by sort of more gradual means. And, and is this a wave? Is it not a wave? Should we be worried around the world today? Or is this kind of within the range of what we see as normal in regime variation? OK, several <laughs> questions in there. Um, we should, uh, I think it's always, uh, always important to be concerned and to be uh, um, looking for warning signs and to be c concerned over the fate of, of democracy. And there's real reason to be concerned. I think the, uh, the, at the time when we wrote our book on competitive authoritarianism a little over a decade ago, there, um, it was, we, we were ensconced in the, in the post-Cold War era and the liberal West was really ascendant. Uh, and that was an incredibly favorable time for democracy around the world. I think many observers were too optimistic because one of the reasons we wrote our book is a, there were dozens of regimes out there in the 1990s and early 2000s that adopted the architecture of democracy, that held competitive elections, that looked democratic from the outside, that weren't really fully democratic. They were actually hybrid regimes. And so a lot of people 15 years ago labeled all those regimes democracies. And a couple of a, a generation or so later, they look around and see that they're not really so democratic and are growing more pessimistic. So I think in part, the pessimism about the uh, sort of the wave of authoritarianism today is, is um, a product of having been too optimistic a little while ago. But why, why, uh, why is democratic erosion taking place in, in the form that it's taking? That in part is a product of the fact that, um, that elections have spread and really institutionalized quite widely in the world, which is a very positive thing. And um, still to this day, in much of the world, it's very, very difficult to, um, to get away with not holding minimally competitive elections. It's very, very difficult, not only because of the international community, but um, because publics. I think in, in 
really every region of the world demand um, electoral, electoral accountability. And so regimes tend to hold on to, this is not true everywhere, but, but, but it's, it's costly to eliminate elections entirely. So the way that, elect, that democracy dies today, uh, much more so than in the 20th century, is through um, elected leaders, elected prime ministers, elected presidents, who use the very institutions of democracy to undermine it. They use it, they, they use, it, uh, they use courts, they use plebiscites and referenda, they use elections, uh, they use parliamentary um, laws to, to, bury, to subvert, and in some cases, bury democracy. And that, that's not entirely new. Perón did that in the, in the 1940s. It's, um, but it's much more common, uh, whereas the, the prime, three out of four democratic breakdowns of the 20th century took place through military coups, through generals uh, or colonels seizing power. That happens today, but it's much, much less frequent. Today, it's usually elected governments that do it themselves. And the, the scary thing is that it's harder to observe. It's harder for citizens to, um, to tell that they're losing their democracy sometimes until it's too late. Mm -hmm. Just so that our audience has a kind of concrete sense of what you're talking about when you say there are some countries that were sort of coded as democracies that probably shouldn't have, but they had elections. Mm -hmm. And now it looks like they're eroding, but maybe they really weren't very democratic to start with. Give us a couple of examples. I think one clear example is Russia. Russia never, never in its history had an electoral turnover. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, we liked Boris Yeltsin. He seemed like he was pro-West. He seemed like a nice guy. Um, Russia, the, the Russian state was in a, uh, a state of, of, of almost chaos during the early 1990s. So he was unable to really, he didn't have the institutional power to govern as a, as a hardcore autocrat. But there were, and so the regime was softer then than it is today. Mm -hmm. But Russia was never democratic. The first time that, that Yeltsin was seriously challenged by the Duma, by the parliament in Russia, he called out the tank and bombed it. Uh, he, he carried out a, a, a self-coup similar to, to Alberto Fujimori in Peru. That was within a year of, of, of his coming to power. The 1996 re-election, the West applauded his re-election because he beat a communist, but the election was, was marred by, by a highly uneven playing field and by electoral fraud. So Russia at no point was uh, a democracy. We called it a new democracy in the early 1990s. We, uh, many, many observers, including academics, if you go back to the mid-1990s, looked at any authoritarian breakdown and kind of assumed that it was, uh, it equated democratic break authoritarian breakdown with transition to democracy. So we assumed that if an authoritarian regime broke down, that the regime was somehow a, in transition to democracy. Mm -hmm. And so when Russia turned out not to be a democracy, and admittedly it's gotten much more authoritarian under Putin, we considered it an, a, a, a sort of a, a democratic recession, a democratic reversal. But I don't think Russia spent a day under democracy. So we need a category for countries that were possible potential democracies and have grown more authoritarian, which is distinct from democracies. Sure, and a lot of these cases, they weren't even potential democracies. I don't, I don't mean to be too pessimistic, but uh, the 1990s were a period where authoritarian regimes were breaking down across the world. So pro, pro, particularly Soviet client states were collapsing. The, uh, in many, many developing countries, economies were terrible. States went bankrupt throughout Africa, throughout the former Soviet Union, in parts of Latin America. So autocrats across the world, uh, first of all, lacked the resources to, to maintain full-scale dictatorships, and secondly, lacked the know-how in this sort of new post-Cold War era where you kind of had to hold elections. Um, people didn't know how to manipulate elections in, in 1991 the same way that they do in 2018. Mm -hmm. so, there were many, many countries that, by any social science theory, um, didn't, were, were not likely to sustain democracy. We know that any country could potentially be democratic, but um, countries that are really poor, countries that have states that don't work, um, countries that have very weak civil society, countries that have very weak private sectors, are unlikely to sustain democracy. So there were many of these countries in the early 1990s, mid-1990s, that held elections and that we were kind of fooled into thinking that they were democratizing. Um, when they didn't, we shouldn't have been shocked. I want to ask you about democratic norms. One of the interesting, distinctive things about the book that, that, the, um, that you and Daniel Ziblatt uh, wrote, How Democracies Die, is the focus on norms, some of them 
formal and some of them, many of them informal, that are implicitly sustaining of democracy and when they're violated, we should worry. Can you talk to us a little bit more about, give us some examples maybe from US politics of, of norms that were democracy sustaining that seem to be under threat today? Sure. Um, actually, this, uh, our, our thinking about this, or my thinking about this, goes back to your chapter in our volume on in informal institutions. In, on informal institutions. We, I've studied informal institutions, unwritten rules for a long time in the context of Latin America. And most of those informal institutions are what you might call subversive informal institutions. They're informal institutions, the rules of the game that get uh, individual citizens, politicians, to behave in ways that subvert the formal rules. But um, it is also the case, and this, this became really clear to me in researching the United States, that many of our formal rules work only because they are sustained by, uh, by informal rules uh, beneath them. So the, this, this brilliant constitution, we've got the oldest, most successful constitution on earth in the United States that uh, many, many Americans have a lot of faith in. It is a pretty well-designed institution. Could not work without a set of unwritten rules sustaining, or at least could not work well. And, the, and we, we, some people take our book to mean that we are sort of enamored with all norms. We're not. We focus on two specific ones. One we call mutual toleration, which is basically the norm in which we treat our rivals, our adversaries, as legitimate actors. We recognize both in private and in public that our partisan rivals are uh, that they're patriotic, they love the country, uh, and they have an equal legitimate right to exist, to do politics, to compete, and if they win an election, to govern us. Um, the second one is what we call uh, forbearance, which is an underutilization of one's uh, legal rights. It is a willingness not to use institutions, uh, the power conferred by institutions to the hilt. It is, it is a, a willingness not to use the letter of the law to subvert the spirit of the law. And I'll give you one example of that, um, maybe the uh, uh, best known in the United States, an example of forbearance. The US Constitution, all of you know, did not, have, uh, did not include presidential term limits until 1951. So prior to 1951, uh, U.S. leaders, American leaders, could be president for life, constitutionally, just mm -hmm. like Hugo Chavez was, just like Daniel Ortega is trying to be. Mm -hmm. It was a, an informal norm of forbearance. It was a willingness to, um, following the precedent set by George Washington, not to seek a third term that, um, so n we had a bunch of, of, of successful, powerful, ambitious presidents, from Andrew Jackson to Thomas Jefferson, uh, to, to Grant, um, who did not seek a third term following a norm of restraint rather than uh, following the letter of the law. So um, we are going to those two institutions, the, uh, a, a shared commitment to treat your rivals as legitimate and a shared commitment to restraint in the deployment of institutions is critical. When you lose those norms, well designed, the same formal institution, the same constitution that seemed to work so well, say, 20th century in the United States can become utterly dysfunctional like 21st century in the United States. So was FDR an eroder of democracy? He was an eroder of, uh, he threatened some democratic norms. Now, um, it's, it's not uncommon during periods of crisis, either severe economic crisis or war, and FDR obviously had both, for leaders to concentrate power and to challenge and sometimes violate norms. FDR did. I mean, one of the most egregious, well, there, there are two egregious ones. Um, one, obviously, the, the informal two-term limit was broken forever under FDR, and it was after FDR that we actually formalized uh, that rule. Um, and uh, secondly, his effort to, to pack the courts. That was the last serious effort to, to pack the courts. Again, that is not illegal. It is entirely constitutional to expand the size of the, of the Supreme Court and fill it with with allies, it is a norm of forbearance, a norm of restraint that prevents presidents from doing that. And yeah, FDR violated that one as well. How much room is there for constitutionalizing some of the norms that we now see being broken? So I would say some. Um, the US is a very, very um, underspecified constitution, very short, 
very basic constitution. So um, it is true that when, you, when, you, when a norm breaks down, when you have a norm like the two-term limit in the United States, and it breaks down, and the, the consensus around it breaks down, and politicians are no longer abiding by it, it is true that, that you can, in some cases, write a formal rule to, uh, to, uh, to basically maintain that behavior. And there are some areas of our law that are really under, I'm not a uh, law expert, but that are very underspecified where you can imagine that happening. My guess is that post-Trump that uh, we're going to get much more specific in terms of conflict of interest laws, uh, which, which are very few right now. We were relying basically on the forbearance of U.S. presidents, on the, on the self-restraint of U.S. presidents not to make a buck or two from being president. Uh, under Trump, you know, Trump is basically the, you know, the, his equivalent, well, he's, he's broken a number of norms, but this is, this is one where he sort of blatantly violated the informal guardrails. So all my guess is you'll see a set of laws passed to correct that in the future. But that said, you can always um, engage in constitutional hardball. There are always ambiguities in the law. There are always ways to use the letter of the law to violate the spirit of the law. You cannot legislate all sort of norm violations out of existence. Um, it's, it's, um, it, it's impossible. There's an underlying problem. It, it's not just legislation that's going to solve our problems. There's an underlying problem of polarization. Mm -hmm. You and Daniel Ziblatt wrote the book in part because you were trying to sound some alarms um, when uh, would-be authoritarians come to office electorally. As you mentioned earlier, it's sometimes hard to know what direction they're going in. What do you think the main alarm, the warning signs are when uh, when a, a elected leader runs for office and um, may indeed turn into someone who violates norms and tries to aggrandize power? That's a great question, uh, an important one for, for citizens who are electing leaders everywhere to, to, to grapple with. We drew heavily on Fun Lin, who in the, was you know, maybe the 20th century's greatest expert on, on democratic breakdown. He uh, was born in Weimar, Germany, and was uh, uh, raised in Franco, Spain, spent a good chunk of his career uh, studying how democracies die. And he, wrote a, a very well-known book called The Breakdown of Democratic Regimes in the 1970s, wasn't the clearest writer in the world always. And so he laid out a, what he called a litmus test for authoritarian behavior that we tried to clean up and refine a little bit. But we took from him that there are four key sort of observable indicators to watch out for. Uh, one is, the, uh, is condoning or encouraging violence. That's a very good predictor of, of authoritarian behavior. Another is this sort of refusal to recognize publicly the legitimacy of your opponent, um, calling your opponent a criminal who belongs in jail. Uh, a third is an expressed willingness to, uh, to curtail the, the civil liberties of your, of your opponents, including the media. And a fourth is a willingness to break uh, with democratic rules. And, um, uh, and what, what basically got us to write, the, led us to write this book was the observation that uh, during the campaign, well before he was president, even during the primaries, Donald Trump was, was ticking off all four of those boxes and engaging in behavior that uh, we as citizens had never seen in the United States, but as scholars of democratic crises in Latin America, in my case, Europe historically, in Daniel's case, we'd seen before in, in democracies in trouble. The, the, the re for me, the real kicker, the what really got me uh, in, in a different place was uh, Trump's questioning of the results of the election, say, uh, anticipating electoral fraud and suggesting that he might not abide by the results of the election. That's the sort of thing that one, anyone who studies Latin America has seen many times, not something I've imagined ever seeing in the I know there are lots of questions out there. I'm going to ask one more, and then we'll open things up to the audience. Um, one of the interesting aspects of your book is the notion of guardrails of democracy. And you point that is institutions or actors that can sort of um, keep democracy from going off, going off the rails. And one of the key actors or institutions you point to as a potentially playing that role are political parties. And you um, notice and, and explain in the book 
how the US political parties, in particular the Republican Party, did not serve as a guardrail for democracy in, in 2016. Some of the critics of your book, I think, have said, well, it sounds like you're advocating for a more, for a less democratic procedure for selecting presidents in that the primary system and the kind of democratization, in a sense, of the primary system after the Watergate crisis um, has, in a sense, led us to weaken the potential guardrails. Could just talk to us about that. What do you, how do you um, see the role of parties? Do you see US parties shifting so that they might play more that role? How should they do that? How do we balance a sort of democratic urge to open up um, the candidate nomination system to voters? Talk to us about that. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're mixing our metaphors a little bit, but this is our fault. We Sorry. use too many <laughs> metaphors in the book. So uh, we use the, the notion of, of gatekeepers to gatekeepers, describe sorry, yes. political parties. Yeah. Um, and we argue that if, if, the, if the path to authoritarianism is to elected leaders, it obviously matters a lot who those elected leaders are, which is why we ought to be paying attention to white citizens should be paying attention to warning signs like candidates who promote violence and don't recognize the legitimacy of their rivals, et cetera. But also, parties play a central role in that, that, uh, that party leaderships are, serve as gatekeepers because they are, wherever parties exist, they're the ones who control nominations. They control directly, in most cases, access to the, the centers of, of power. So uh, what the way that parties relate to demagogues or to extremist outsiders is very, very important. Parties can uh, opportunistically align with demagogues because they're popular and maybe they don't, they, they're uh, a party in decline that needs to sort of shore up its base, or they can distance themselves systematically from uh, dangerous demagogues in, in, in defense of, of democracy. Um, what we argue, and this is uh, among the many unpopular parts of our book, almost certainly the least popular thing we say in the book, is we argue that primaries are, are double-edged. Primaries are much more democratic than any system of candidate selection we ever had in the past, and certainly compared to the old uh, so-called smoke-filled rooms with which we nominated candidates prior to 1972, party bosses basically would, uh, uh, would get together in conventions and, and, and negotiate a candidate. Um, the system we have now is much more transparent, it's much more inclusionary, uh, and it's much more democratic than, than anything we had before. Um, what it, but we think it's double-edged because it um, disempowers party leaders. It means that party leaders really are no longer able to play the gatekeeping role um, that they once played. Um, for a while, we kind of thought they did during the 1980s and 90s, but it's, it's, they have far fewer tools to prevent a popular demagogue from seizing the nomination. You saw this with, with, um, with the Republican Party. We think the Republican Party failed twice on the gatekeeping front. Only one has to do with primaries. The first one is, if you go back, it's hard to remember now, but if you go back to the primaries in 2016, Republicans almost to a person despised Donald Trump. They thought he was an awful candidate. They knew he was a demagogue. They said he was a demagogue. They knew he was unfit for office. They said he was unfit for office, um, but they didn't have any tools to stop him. They really didn't have any tools to stop him. Um, the other way they failed, and this has nothing to do with primaries, is after the nomination. What, what Republicans could have done, and this may be asking a lot of them, but if they, if, if they were really concerned that Trump was unfit for office and a danger to institutions, which is, thing, which is stuff they said in private, and stuff they said in public during the primaries, um, they could have endorsed Hillary Clinton, which would have assured that Trump lost the election. But, it, but we, we, we do think that there's a double-edged nature to primaries. And um, we don't have a great solution to that. But I personally, and I, I probably about, I'm among three or four people on, on in, in the entire country who takes this position, but I actually think that the, the system of superdelegates that the Democrats had, the Democratic Party had, prior to 2016, pre-2016, which at least gives party leaders, elected party leaders, a say in the nomination without imposing or determining the nominee, that a hybrid system, which gives voters a, a, a voice, uh, party members a voice, and party leaders, at least some say, may be the sort of least bad solution. But the vast majority of Americans 
prefer primaries. They want a more democratic system. And so I think it's really difficult, um, if not impossible, to go back. Do you think after the primaries, a lot of Republicans thought that Trump was going to lose so, lose so badly that they thought the electorate was going to, in a sense, take care of the problem. They didn't have to take a public stance against their party because he wasn't going to become president. They may have. I mean, uh, basically, the entire um, elite took that position. I mean, the Obama administration behaved as if it knew Clinton was going to win. James Comey behaved in a way as if he knew Clinton was going to win. And I think, yeah, it's very plausible that most Republican leaders adopted the same position. I don't know that for sure. Okay, we're going to open um, up to questions. Um, we need you to go to, to speak through a mic, not because obviously it's a small room, but we are um, broadcasting this or we're taping it for future broadcasts. So um, I think there are a couple hands up over here. Hi. Um, I wondered if you, your research has examined the idea of ranking candidates rather than the winner takes all version that we have today. So I haven't examined it, but um, let me say this. The um, Americans are very small C conservative when it comes to our institutions. Many of our electoral institutions date back to the 18th or early 19th century, and we kind of treat them almost biblically, like you know, they're handed down by the fathers, so we can't touch them. There's been a fair amount of institutional innovation and uh, across the world in the last couple hundred years, and it's probably worth examining from time to time whether there are other ways of running elections, other uh, electoral rules, other electoral systems that might perform better than our own. And ranked choice voting is one, one possibility. Americans tend to be, again, very, very slow to think seriously about institutional reform. And, and there, are, there are both positive and negative consequences to that. It means our institutions are very strong. Um, but but we are, are, we're slow to innovate. And so we're now beginning, there are a, a number of people, uh, including friends and colleagues of mine, have been really pushing for uh, ranked choice voting as a, as a way of overcoming polarization. Interestingly, so we argue in the book that partisan polarization and socio-political polarization is at the root of the erosion of our norms. And uh, I think it's, it's reasonable to think about using electoral rules to help to combat or overcome that polarization. What, one thing that's interesting, though, is that our electoral system, which I think is flawed in a number of ways, is actually not usually associated with a lot of polarization. Our electoral system, a first-past-the-post system, historically, most of the time, has led parties to converge on the center. It's, it's, it's political scientists have been historically concerned that our electoral system is too depolarizing. It creates two bland centrist parties rather than generating polarization. Um, so I'm somewhat skeptical that the, that the problem or the primary solution lies in electoral systems, even though I think it is worth experimenting with, with ranked choice voting as they are, for example, in Maine. Hmm? Two questions on different sides of the spectrum. Um, first, on emerging democracy, let's talk about Arab Spring and the most recent quote by the senior um, sheikh or emirate of the UAE who said that um, Arabs are not ready for democracy because if they were given that, they would just vote for Islamics. So what are your thoughts about um, trends in emerging democracy, and is it all related to just basic economics, or are there other forces at play? Okay, so those are two that questions. Was the that, first, well, that was the first side of the spectrum. The <laughs> other, totally unrelated, what are your thoughts about um, cyber technology and techno social technologies in general and their effect on the um, maintenance of democracy as we know it? Okay, uh, two big, tough questions. So um, it's funny how you always hear these stories about the people um, not being ready for democracy being told by autocrats in power. <laughs> um, I think if you look, and I'm not an expert on the Middle East, I'm not an expert on, on Arab states, but if you, and there, and there certainly is a political problem around polarization over religion, basically Islamists versus secularists. That's, that's a, a polarizing force 
in many Arab states that can destabilize democracy, just like it led to a, a stillborn democratization in, in Egypt and also Algeria a few decades ago. But mo the much more damage against democracy has been done in the name of combating Islam than has been done by Islamists. Uh, I, it, there, it's hard to find a, um, well, there haven't been many democratization efforts in, in the Middle East, but it's, uh, it, was, it was not the Islamists who killed democracy in Algeria in 1991-92. It was the army that overthrew democracy after the Islamists won an election. Uh, same thing in Egypt. There, you, there, there, you know, some of Morsi's behavior in power was questionable, but the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood government was not particularly authoritarian. The much more damage was done to uh, Egyptian democracy by the military that overthrew Morsi than Morsi himself. Um, so I'm, and, and this is also true historically of Turkey, I should say. Um, um, it, uh, Turkey went through basically two generations of either semi-democratic or undemocratic rule in the name of banning Islam. Uh, it was not until the, the 21st century that, that Islam was still in power. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I think it's far from clear that Islamists are a direct threat to, uh, to democracy. Fear of Islam seems to have done more damage than, than Islam itself. Um, the other question was about, so I'm not an expert uh, on, uh, on the uh, social media and, and media technology. I think there, our concern in the book is about polarization and there is some evidence, it's pretty recent, but there's some pretty good evidence that our exposure to social media does have a polarizing effect, that the more that we get our news from, from social media, the, that does tend to have a polarizing effect. But I guess two caveats in response to that. One, um, it, th that's th that it may be an exacerbating factor. It is not the fundamental cause of polarization in the United States. It is, we know from, from cases across history that uh, you know, the, the, they didn't need Twitter in Spain to go to civil war in the 1930s. They didn't need Facebook in Chile in the 1970s to, to, for democracy to break down. It's quite possible to, to, uh, to experience devastating polarization in the absence of social media. I think the, the causes of this, of this country's political polarization lie elsewhere, even if they're exacerbated by social media. The other thing, I think this may be a little um, Pollyannish, but um, you know, we've had other dramatic technological, media te technological changes in the past that scared us. Uh, radio scared us, we thought it was gonna bring us fascism. Television scared us, we thought it was gonna bring us demagogues and populists. Uh, and and uh, new media, te social media is now scaring us again. In these previous uh, iterations, both societies, politicians, and eventually states and regulations adapted. And I have at least, and this is, without empirics, this is pretty naive, but I have at least some faith that we'll adapt to the contemporary changes as well. I'm a little less terrified than some. Hi, um, so my question involves the two unwritten norms that you mentioned, uh, mutual toleration and uh, forbearance. And it seems like forbearance depends on mutual toleration because yeah. if you can you know, tolerate the other side being in power, you're less likely to use the letter yes, of the law absolutely. to undermine them. Um, and so it seems like we have a breakdown in mutual toleration today at, that's particularly acute. And I'm curious, have you seen examples in the past where mutual toleration has broken down? <coughs> and if so, how was it rebuilt? And uh, if we haven't seen any examples of rebuilding, what do you think that we can do to try and bring some of that mutual toleration back? That's a great question, and you're absolutely right. We think there, um, there, there is a, a clear relationship between the two. And when mutual toleration breaks down, politicians then have a very strong incentive to abandon forbearance. We think that's exactly what's happening. So we've, we, get, we get this sort of question a lot, and I've been searching around for examples of, of societies that sort of come to the brink and, uh, and, and polarization sort of brings them to the brink and then they step back and, and rebuild mutual toleration. And um, there aren't a lot of them. One case which is very, very different from the United States um, is the Netherlands a little over a century ago. And uh, we tend to think of the Dutch as uh, 
very accommodating and tolerant, but they were pretty, pretty divided in the first couple decades of the 20th century over class issues, left versus right, but also over religious issues, secular versus uh, Protestant versus Catholic. And um, at, at least according to La Arndt Leipart, the, the Netherlands could easily have sort of spun into a uh, democratic breakdown, as many of its neighbors did. But uh, they had very, very well-organized political parties and interest groups that came together before the country got to the brink and negotiated basically a new way of doing politics which involved pretty elaborate power sharing mechanisms. Um, it's, it's extremely, it's difficult to imagine the United States following anything like it, but if, if you're looking for, um, for examples, that's one of them. The other cases that I know of mutual toleration existing, being lost, and being rebuilt are not happy stories. They're stories of countries that have plunged into the abyss, whether it's Spain after the Civil War or uh, post-World War II Germany or Chile in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, it took politicians going into the abyss and suffering the worst outcome before they realized that they had to find a new way of doing politics. So um, I don't think it's very likely that, po that, it that politicians will, um, that our political elite will sort of come to a realization that they need to change things. Um, I think either we will suffer a severe crisis or the conditions that drive our polarization will change. And I think that the most, my own, and I'm not an expert in American politics, and not an expert in American electoral politics in particular, but I think the most viable route to depolarizing our politics is for the Republican Party to be compel compelled to become a more diverse political party. The Republican Party has to suffer a series of electoral defeats that forces it to begin to appeal to secular, urban, and non-white voters. When it does that, when the Republican Party, and, and, I, and I think this will eventually happen, figures out a way to compete seriously for urban and non-white voters, then it will be, uh, then it will, uh, one, be more competitive elections, two, be less fearful of a multiracial America, and that will eventually lead to its moderation. When the Republican Party moderates, our, I think our politics will depolarize. Um, I also had a question about the two democratic norms that you identify specifically about um, forbearance. Um, the way I understand it, you, was, you said the willingness not to use the letter of the law to destroy the spirit of the law. Um, and I guess I was interested in the, the the hypothetical question of in a democratic state, do you believe that it's possible for politicians to break the letter of the law to uphold the spirit of the law? Hmm. Um, kind of flipping that and seeing if that norm still holds or if that changes or if that's even possible or do you think objectively breaking the law will always erode democracy? That's a great question. Um, I had not really reflected too much on it, but I think my, my answer without much thought is that there must be circumstances where it's appropriate and maybe important to break the letter of the law in defense of the spirit of the law. I think that's what civil disobedience historically has been about. Among the most important democratizing movements in modern United States history is the US Civil Rights Movement, which did precisely that, I would argue. Um, so I, I'm, tr I'm trying rapidly to think of a good contemporary example, and I'm sure one will come to me tonight when I'm on the plane. <laughs> but, um, but my guess is such circumstances must exist. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, erosions in the faith in democracy among people. I think it's um, research by your colleague Yasha Monk who has shown that. Um, he's not my colleague. He's a grad student at Harvard. Oh, really? Okay. Well, everyone calls him a professor, but he was just a man. <laughs> okay. Just a visiting. Um, he's, anyhow, research by a, Yasha he's Monk, a, he's whatever his relationship <laughs> to you is, um, has shown that there's been like, you know, constant declines in the, in the faith in democracy as a whole. Um, over the last you know decade or two, and I was wondering if you could talk about that decline, what you think has brought that about, and how uh, we can go about you know making faith in democracy more robust than it is. So it's a great question. I, the evidence is um, well, the evidence is pretty good that there's been a decline in trust in democratic institutions and in faith in democracy. There's a little more controversy about Monk's claim that younger people are less committed to democracy. 
uh, th that's the, I think the evidence is much more mixed and, and people's views are much more contested. I'm not sold on young, uh, Yasha's position there. But the, that, that um, millennials on down have less faith in our democratic process, I think is, seems pretty un uncontroversial, at least in public opinion. What is that about? There are, uh, I think it's, it's kind of over-determined. Um, and I, I don't think we have a clear answer, certainly not a single variable. But uh, one factor, which is not unimportant, is the fact that 40% of Americans have, um, of American families have seen no progress in their incomes since 1975. We've had two generations of income stagnation for the bottom 40% of, of this country. That can lead to declining faith in the democratic process. Another, um, another major factor is as income inequality has skyrocketed in the United States, the influence of money on politics has also skyrocketed, such that uh, many Mar American voters look at their elected politicians and believe, and they're not wrong, that those politicians are more responsive to donors than they are to voters. There has been an oligarchization of, that was not well pronounced, <laughs> I got up at 3.30. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to try it a third time to pronounce it, but you know. I'm not talking about weapons. <laughs> there, um, money has al uh, big, big money has always had an extraordinary amount of influence over American politics relative to other democracies. But the last 20, 20 years has been obscene. And so many Americans look at their elected politicians and do not believe, uh, with some legitimacy, that they represent them, that they represent voters. That's another factor. Um, uh, Another one, which, uh, which we were talking about in Sue's class earlier today, is um, the Electoral College. If you are a, a millennial or younger, there have been two presidential elections in your young lifetime in which the winner, uh, the loser of the popular vote, won the presidency. You look, if you grew up in, in a world of, of you know, post-2000, um, democracy looked pretty stupid. I mean, it looked pretty crappy, right? The system does not seem to work very well. Um, and so a combination, I think, of growing inequality, declining income mobility, economic factors, the relationship between economics and politics, and the overwhelming influence of money and politics, which has always been high in the United States but is now obscene, combined with some institutional sort of pathologies in our system, make our system look pretty, pretty bad to people who uh, uh, who didn't grow up with in, in, in sort of the glow of, of the aftermath of World War II or in the high stakes Cold War. Um, that, that, I guess that's where I, I would start. How do we correct it? Um, American politicians have to convince voters, particularly younger voters, that they are actually listening, that they're responsive to voters. Um, the, the, the United States is an incredibly heterogeneous, diverse place. So the answer to that, what voters want is a very complicated question. Uh, but certainly, uh, reforms that would begin, or at least convince Americans that, that we're beginning to reduce the influence of money on politics would be a step forward. Just a quick footnote on that. Well, this is regarding um, belief in democracy and, and the, the monk hypothesis. My understanding, mostly from your colleague Pippa Norris's work, is that there's been a decline across all age groups since the, let's say, early 90s in faith and democracy, whatever the, those questions are tapping into. Um, but it, and, and the young people have persistently, over time, been, had lower levels of faith in it. But younger people are not, we're not seeing a bigger gap between younger and older people. It's not the case that the young are newly more skeptical than they had been in earlier periods. So in other words, there's some kind of change over time, mm -hmm. which is not good news. Um, but there also are life cycle effects that have been there probably for a long time, where for some reason old fogies like me are more pro-democratic than, than youngsters like Steve. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Steve and Sue, for a great conversation. Um, I have two questions, but one is from my doctor. So I'm going to ask mine first, and then I'll ask my <laughs> doctor's question. Um, <laughs> <coughs> so, well, so my first question really, and, and these themes have already kind of come up, but <coughs> this kind of, th this 
idea of forbearance and the informal norms supporting them, and at the same time, this, the notion of sort of going to the hilt. And sometimes when I sort of look at our current situation in the U.S., I think well, the, there's sort of a lopsidedness. There's a willingness to go to the hilt and play the and you know play hardball on one side, and then the other side is sort of constrained by this norm of well, we don't want to seem like we're doing that or that's not how we do this, and we give people the benefit of the doubt, and you know, uh, and so on and so forth, and and. And it's not only, I mean, a lot of it's happening in Congress right now where you see the, you know, the House versus the Senate, but it goes back further. And so you just mentioned the, um, the Electoral College, and I'm reminded that there was, there was some pretty serious talk, including by some faculty here in our department, of this is the time when the Electoral College should not honor, you know, this is what the Electoral College was literally invented to do. Not, it's a formal institution. It's written in the Constitution. It's right. formally there to prevent uh, populists from winning. And yet it was constrained by an informal norm that basically says it never does that ever. And so there's sort of this tension between these, these norms and, 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 the, and, the, and the kind of the specific way they play out, with one side always opting for constraint, or not always, but it seems like that. So I wondered mm -hmm. if you wanted to comment on that. And if that's the case, what about some of these proposals out there? You know, let's pack the courts, or let's make Puerto Rico or Washington, D.C., give them se seats in the Senate, or let's, uh, you know, let's impeach, you know, even if we know it's not going to go anywhere. Um, you know, sort of countering this notion of, well, let's just, let's just wait and see if, this, if the election will sort things out. My doctor's question was, he found out <laughs> I was a political scientist, and he was just like, what's going on in the world? Do you have any answers? You know? So that's really my question. But in, I'll, I'll, kind of try to, I'll try to... <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to, as you said, I'll try to refine it a little bit. <laughs> I, it is, it, it, I guess, you know, you mentioned this kind of like, well, there was this wave of democratization that turned out to actually not really be that democratized. So maybe that's explaining some of this sort of zeitgeist of movement towards authoritarianism. But of course, a lot of the big cases that we care about aren't really in that category. So Brazil and even Venezuela and the U.S., if you count it, and a lot of the Euro right, you know, right-wing nationalism in Europe. So mm -hmm. it explains some of it, maybe Hungary or your Russia's or whatever, but it does seem like there's something bigger happening. Philippines, it just seems like there's something bigger happening on the world stage. And it, you know, I mean, it's a lot of conjecturing, but I just, I would love, you know, to sort of hear what your conjectures are about what are these deeper historical roots that are, that are driving all of this. So I'll take, the, I'll take the doctor's question <laughs> second. Um, I think there's a lot to be worried about um, in, in for a couple of really basic reasons. One, the geopolitical environment has changed dramatically since the 1990s, uh, which is sort of a high point for global democracy. Uh, not only is the liberal West uh, weaker, uh, with much less prestige, much less uh, self-confidence, much less influence than it had 20, 25 years ago. But as you pointed out, there is a, an illiberal, anti-liberal movement within the West itself. In, class, in fact, it governs the United States. The United States is no longer interested in promoting democracy. It's just, it was at least in, uh, in a mixed way in the 1990s. And so um, the international environment is, I would say, considerably less favorable to democracy than it was um, in the 1990s. That, that's a lot to worry about. And, um, and I'm very worried about, uh, in, in part because we didn't anticipate it and I don't think had many social science tools to understand it, the, the sort of emerging challenges to democracy within the liberal West. Um, outside the liberal West, in the developing post-communist world, I think we're still at, at, at yeah, Venezuela gets a lot of attention, rightly so. Uh, I'm really worried about Brazil. Brazil's democracy hasn't died yet. Uh, democracy's died in three or four or five really prominent cases. Um, I think Hungary's an important case. Uh, Thailand's an important case. Venezuela's an important case. Philippines, we'll see. Um, but basically, we've been at a flat line over the last 15 years. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of reason for concern. If the number of democracies in the world plummets by 10 in the next uh, decade, there we'll, we'll understand why. My, my main point is it hasn't happened yet. And in fact, it's actually somewhat surprising and heartening that most democracies have, in fact, su survived a much more challenging environment than 20 years ago. Um, again, I, I, there's reason to be worried. I just, th I just don't think empirically that there is the democratic decline that some people are, are talking about. Um, 
the, uh, so your point about asymmetry, th absolutely correct. Um, this, is, this is not a, um, a, 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 a tangle of two. This is, this is an asymmetrical process. The Republican Party, there, now there's been some tit for tat beginning of the 1980s, but the, the most egregious acts of constitutional hardball have almost all come from the Republican Party. And some of the most pernicious acts of constitutional hardball, I'm thinking about particularly efforts to uh, make it more difficult for low income and non-white voters in particular to vote uh, are coming exclusively from the Republican Party. This is a, uh, an asymmetric process. And I think, um, I think there are reasons for that. I think that the Republican Party, I the, the base of the Republican Party is, um, is, a, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is in a unique circumstance in that it is a once established and socially dominant majority in decline. Um, and the loss of that, not only electoral majority, 74% of voters in 1994, the year of the Gingrich Revolution, when I was in graduate school, not that long ago, were white, uh, were white and Christian, 74%. By 2014, it was 58%. By 2024, it's going to be less than 50%. Uh, the Republican Party is now an almost exclusively white and Christian party. Um, that is electorally unsustainable going into the future. But it's worse than that because losing elections is not, it's not just losing power. It's, lo it's, it's, it's associated with a, a loss of, of social status, and, um, which is deeply, deeply threatening to much of the Republican base. So the, 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 the stakes are perceived to be very high and the, the sense of loss very severe, um, which I think is the primary reason why the Republicans have become essentially averse to losing. They're playing dirty out of desperation. Um, and the question is, which I don't think anybody has a clear answer to, and I do not, is how the Democrats should respond. So with the first mover are the Republicans, and they, and they move in an authoritarian direction, they begin to break norms and rules, how do you, how do you respond? Um, the argument that we touch on in the book, and which I still adhere to, although I really am uncertain, is that it's in the Democrats' best interest to engage in norm-preserving behavior. That a tit-for-tat process will lead to escalation, which will be destructive in, in the medium term. That the, the, the Republicans are operating with very narrow time horizons because they can't, as constituted, they can't win in the medium term. So they're pulling out all the stops to hold on to power now. Um, now, if they can get away with that, if they can actually turn the US into Hungary, then there's an argument for uh, the Democrats pulling all the stops to stop them. But if you believe that there are limits to the damage that they can do, and the Democrats can, and that a competitive elections can survive in the medium term, there's an argument to be made for caution on the Democrats' part, because they stand to win in the medium term. And uh, if, you, if you stand to win in the medium term, you don't want to inherit a democracy that's either been destroyed or rendered utterly dysfunctional, which is basically where we're going now, by, uh, by the destruction of our norms. So in this, so I don't think anybody's got an answer to this, and which is why people, very like-minded people, are lining up in very different positions on things like court packing. Uh, my position in, in general is that Democrats should use caution, that the Democratic Party leadership has been pretty much right on. I don't, I don't view impeachment and court packing quite the same way. I think court packing would be outright constitutional hardball. I think impeachment, the norm regarding impeachment is not don't ever use it. The norm is use it cautiously. Use it ex only under exceptional circumstances. I think an argument can be made that we're facing pretty exceptional circumstances. So I'm, I'm not, I don't necessarily see Democrats using impeachment as a as a norm violation. We have a, oh sorry, go ahead, Will, yeah. I, I wanted to pick up on just this point. Um, and the way in which we think about your book as a call for norm preservation, as opposed to the way in which we think of it as a call for the need for institutional reform. 
wherein the latter might <laughs> lead for a less need for reliance on <laughs> norms for the preservation of democracy. The example you gave over the two mm. terms in office is a sort of clear, natural example of it. Yeah. You can think of all kinds of ways in which institutional reforms to our politics would curb the excesses of the Trump presidency in ways that would be really salutary. And then the call for the Democrats, should they win in 2020, is not a call for them to behave well according to a set of norms, but rather to get to work on attending to institutional reforms in the service of, for instance, the depoliticization of the administrative state. Right. Um, you could think about how we want to rethink the pardon power. There are all, all sorts of clear kind of rules that govern our politics that maybe we ought to be revisiting in the service of a better politics that don't have to do with a gesture towards forbearance or mutual toleration, but that would be to the good. No? Makes perfect sense to me. I just don't, I don't see where the two are uh, so much in tension with one another. No, they're not. I think they're ones of emphasis. You can, you can be doing both, absolutely. But rather than saying to the Democrats, look, play, by, play well and recover a sense of forbearance, you could say, let's be very clear what we mean by a set of powers that right now are somewhat ambiguous and so therefore we have to call for forbearance. So with right. regard to um, impeachment, what you're saying is, well, it should be rare, but you could be even clearer about the conditions under which it can be used yeah. so that you don't need the norm, or at least the norm is less instructive because yeah. there are clearer criteria upon which it's meant to be deployed. That kind of thing. Same thing yeah. with subpoena power, same things with. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Uh, and this. Uh, Columbia constitutional scholar David Posen has proposed the, uh, the strategy, not the greatest term in the world, but anti-constitutional hardball reforms, or something like that, <laughs> uh, which is carry out reforms that blunt Republican power grabs at the same time diffusing partisan escalation by lowering the stakes. So respond to gerrymandering, not with New Jersey style Democratic gerrymandering, but with independent redistricting commissions. Respond to stolen Supreme Court seats, not by core packing, but although this may not be constitutional, term limits and rotation on the Supreme Court, things that uh, measures, reforms aimed at depoliticizing the, the state rather than, than escalating the politicization. I, I agree completely. Can I, I want to push, push ahead with the same kind of question. So what about sort of saying, OK, the norm has changed. What's the new norm? So Pete. Buttigieg, for example, is going around saying, OK, so we had eight Supreme Court justices for a long period of time, you know, more than a year. And so the norm of having nine of them it no longer holds. We have a flexible number of Supreme Court justices. And we are going to, so this is, so, you know, we're not going to pack the court. We're going to have another different number of justices. So what's, why not? Like repackage the norms since they've been violated, maybe they're gone. Um, to in ways that all that are also a little bit of a slap on the wrist, like you know, you do this, we can, we we will. We're not going to be arbitrary, we're, but we're going to recognize when there's an, uh, the norm is gone. There's a new norm, and here's what it is. And you you folks wrote this, so you're going to live with it. Let me respond. I don't know if I believe that, by the I way, but I mean, <laughs> first of all, we we sometimes get interpreted as. Uh, being wedded to all norms under all circumstances, we're not. We're two general but pretty narrowly defined norms about the way you treat your political opponents and the way you relate to institutions. Um, and so whether a particular norm, whether it has to do with reelection or uh, there, there are all sorts of norms that I may think are positive, negative, ought to be changed. Norms get changed all the time, appropriately so. Uh, in this case, I think what, what you're talking about, and I'm, Buttigieg has been in several different positions here, uh, sometimes in ones that I like more than others. But um, what you're describing, I, I think, sounds too much like poli further politicization of, of the court. Um, and I think that's dangerous, especially for, as, a, as an expert on Latin American politics, I think that's a dangerous road to go down. It's true that the courts have been heavily politicized, but I would worry a lot about Democrats contributing to that politicization as opposed to, because the, the, again, de Democrats are in good 
shape moving forward. A progressive coalition is in decent shape going forward. If we do not have institutions that work that are functional in this country for 10 or 20 years, um, Democrats and progressive coalition stand to lose. And an independent judiciary and effective autonomous institutions are a, a, they're hard to construct and they're easy to lose. And I worry a lot about taking steps that would accelerate or reinforce the politicization of the courts. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that the way that you describe that particular Buddhist exposition worries me. Mm -hmm. We have somebody up here. Do we have more? Do we have time or one more question? Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on the global question earlier. Uh, I was wondering if you were following along uh, and had any thoughts on the elections in India uh, recently that just concluded and any concerns that you see there about any sort of possible erosion of democracy uh, I've seen I've heard concerns from my like my liberal elite friends who have one set but then I don't see anything on the ground uh, that my family etc are, are living there right now so I think there's a lot to be concerned about I mean I'm not um, I India so my, I've been I've been skeptical of claims over the last decade that um, that there's sort of this autocratic resurgence and large-scale democratic recession. But I can point to two very big, very important democracies that if, uh, if they experience backsliding, I'll worry a lot. And they're Brazil, which you mentioned, Ben, and India. And those are two, two countries where uh, democracy is, is threatened much more than, than 10 or 20 years ago, and where there's a lot of reason for concern. Uh, a, a, a parliamentary majority in the hands of a of a party with as, as as much of a history of illiberalism as the BJP is is worrisome. Just as the presidency in the hands of uh, a man who is openly embraced uh, authoritarianism and and, uh, and extrajudicial violence is a is a threat to democracy. It doesn't mean that democracy is dead. It doesn't necessarily mean that democracy is dying. Luckily, in both Brazil and India, you have relatively strong civil societies, relatively democratic cultures and reasonably strong democratic institutions. So democracy has at least a fighting chance in both cases, but there, it's, a, it's a case to worry about a lot. I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on India, but um, you know, if the, the fate of Indian and Brazilian democracy in the next five or 10 years, I think is, gonna, is going to say a lot about um, the global patterns of, of the fate of democracy in, in, in much of the global south over the next generation. Please join me in thanking Steve. Thank you.